Good day everyone, and welcome to this GI Academy intro talk on user interface and user experience in games. My name is Alex Tukmakchiev and I am a lead UI UX game designer at Creative Assembly. My name is Anna Wickstrom, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about where we come from and what even CA means. So it's a, it's a short version of Creative Assembly, and Creative Assembly is actually one of the UK's biggest uh, game studios with over 800 people right now. And um, it's been around for quite a while. Um, and if you're interested in finding out more about what kind of roles we have open and everything, go check out the website because it's over 40 um, roles open right now. So do check it out and see if there's anything that's interesting to you. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about who I am. So, like I said, I'm a UX game designer at Creative Assembly. And, but on my, on my side time, I'm actually um, also writing some articles on over at Medium. So I'm talking about uh, game design, UX design, and a lot of books I'm reading right now that's interesting in these topics. And I'm also contributing for the um, Women in Games together with Creative Assembly. So I'm, on, I'm an ambassador for that. And I'm doing a lot of these type of talks and um, in presentations about video game design and um, encouraging women to also get games in, uh, get, get work in video games. On my side, I'm, in, I'm actually very really interested in uh, fantasy games, and I'm doing um, some games regularly together with some uh, of my colleagues, and we're playing Dungeons and Dragons. So let me talk a little bit about my background. So my first introduction to uh, video game design was actually to work on Star Wars Battlefront 2. As that was my introduction, I uh, worked there at the DICE for um, finishing the game before it was released. And when it was released, I helped out on the extra game modes and updates coming on to the game. Um, it was a lot of fun to just add additions and listen to feedback, what people wanted to see in the game. And after that, I helped out a little bit on the Battlefield 5 game before the release. Um, but now I'm working on a totally new game here at Creative Assembly, but I can't really talk about it because it's a new IP, but it is a first-person shooter. That's kind of everything I can say right now. If we look at how I got here and how I even got a job in the gaming industry, I actually started on a different side with photo and photography editing. Uh, but after a while, I wanted to do something else. So I went to a design school at Hyper Island in Sweden. And then I moved on to doing some design in mobile design and on the UI side, but then I transitioned into the UX side and that's how I got introduced to um, working at DICE and I got into the game industry. So Alex here again. Um, as I said earlier, uh, I'm a lead UI UX game designer on uh, Total War specifically. I'm also an avid uh, game jammer and organizer of Sofa Game Jam. Uh, game jams are absolutely amazing, uh, an incredible way to, uh, you know, get a feel for what it means to create a, create a game uh, in a short period of time and meet lots of cool people. So I strongly suggest uh, attending one, whether it's offline or online. I'm also a proud member of the We Can Fix It in UI uh, community, which is a gathering of UI and UX uh, designers and artists from the games industry, where we basically try and help each other promote best practices in UI and UX and, uh, you know, be there for each other when we need it. Uh, finally, uh, I'm a huge, huge fan of uh, Cowboy Bebop. Uh, I had a kind of similar uh, way into games uh, to Anna. Uh, I started uh, at a design school that I joined uh, when I was like 14, uh, spent five years there. And then uh, immediately after I got out of school, instead of going to university, I was like, okay, I'm ready to work. So uh, I got a fir my first job was in web design. I did that for a couple of years before transitioning into mobile design. Uh, then doing work on product design, which is basically uh, leading uh, uh, product design in terms of UI, UX and features. Uh, for e-commerce, online banking, and other software tools. And at one point, I was like, okay, 
none of this is making me happy. Let's finally pursue the one thing that I really, really am passionate about and want to do. So uh, I decided to transition to games and that's how we're here. Uh, for the past few years, I've been working uh, solely on Total War. Uh, I was the lead uh, UI designer on a Total War Saga Troy and then on its huge expansion, Total War Troy Mythos, which brought like all of the ancient Greek mythical monsters to, uh, to Troy. Uh, and let you tame them and fight with them. And I've also uh, helped out the teams on uh, Total War Warhammer 3 and Total War Arena. Right, so let's move to the, to the actual topic of this, uh, of this talk. And the first part of it is WTF is Games User Interface. And um, I'm, I'm just going to show you a screen and, and that's going to explain everything for you, trust me. Boom, there we go. It's pretty much this. UI is an amalgamation of buttons, bars, icons, menus, maps, counters, trackers, labels, text, tooltips, and Lord knows what else. I mean, sure, now, th this screenshot from World of Warcraft that even uses custom user interface is pretty much the most extreme and possibly ugliest and most overwhelming UI that I can show you as an example, but it really does have everything. And, uh, now, is a good illustration of what UI is. Sure, this is bad UI, but it is still UI. However, uh, UI is actually so, so, so many things. So let's go through some of them. You know, on a more serious note, uh, it's just, you might be thinking that UI is just all of those things that I just uh, went through, but it's actually more than what most people imagine. So, for example, UI gives us a way to present information to the player in a beautiful way that matches the overall aesthetics of the game. Like in this screen here that we have from Total War Three Kingdoms, where the reforms, also known as the technology tree uh, UI, that is so, so very common in uh, strategy games, is quite literally presented as a cherry that blossoms and grows with each technology you, re you research. You start, off, you start off small and you see where all of the branches are, you see the icons, but uh, it looks like a dead tree until you start actually unlocking and researching the different reforms and then all of it blooms together. And UI is also amazing at enhancing the visual style of a game and giving it a further sense of, a further sense of authenticity. As it, as you can see here, uh, from these shots from Total War Saga Troy, where we incorporated the famous and distinctive style of ancient Greek vase painting with figures depicted with strong outlines and with thin lines within the outlines. You see here in the top left corner some of the references that we used and then we took those and kind of like tried to incorporate them into the overall aesthetic of our user interface uh, in various stages, in like our faction mechanics, in even our loading screens and also our buttons. Um, what else? Uh, UI is how we communicate and represent various information to the player. Uh, like for example, and that information can really, really be anything. Like take this example in Apex Legends. Here in the span of a few seconds, we use UI in combination with the actual gameplay, of course, to serve contextual information that is relevant to what's currently happening to the player in the game. Notice that in this like two second clip, we show information about how much damage the shots of the player are doing with the little numbers that pop off uh, above the enemy player. Uh, we also communicate that they're learning, learning low on ammunition and they need to reload, uh, that they have eliminated another player, that they can use a finisher uh, when the enemy player is at low health in order to uh, off them and that they have teammates nearby that can be recovered. And that is on top of the rest of the uh, UI information that is constantly visible and provides navigational, orientational, and player state information. Here's another example from Apex Legends that shows that UI is also one of the main ways that the players can interact with the games we make. And just like with communicating information, the variety of those interactions is pretty crazy. Uh, let's go through a few. Like, for example, here we have choosing a weapon via a ring menu, 
very, very common uh, in first-person shooters or in third-person action games, especially those that are on consoles, because that's an incredibly intuitive way to actually quickly switch between different um, uh, items, whether they're weapons or support items or whatever. Or here in Dishonored 2, where we use UI, when the player uses UI to navigate through the various menus. Here we can see the main menu that uh, the, the player is at, and they go to the options, which puts them into a sub-menu, and so forth and so on. Uh, what other interactions we have? Take this example from Tom Clancy's The Division 2, where the player is uh, browsing, searching, filtering, and equipping items. So basically, we have uh, full item management interactions that are, uh, that are exposed to the player. Or uh, this example from Alien Isolation, where through UI, the player can interact with in-game models, in-game in items. Uh, so, for example, in here, they've opened up this little uh, kind of like chest thing, and uh, they can decide to either take all of the items from it, or uh, take a specific item, or just leave it be and exit. And there are many, many, many more examples of how UI can be used. So, what is the purpose, right? Let's sum up some of the things that we've gone through. So, number one, uh, the number one purpose of UI is to communicate to the player. And that is incredibly important. Sure, we, we can use the game itself, uh, the environment, to communicate to the player, whether they're, for example, taking damage, uh, or how fast they're running, or where are enemies. But the interface sits on top of that, and it makes it even, uh, it makes it that much easier for players to tell what is happening. And then there are some things that cannot be accomplished just in the game itself. Like, for example, you know, navigating through all of the uh, menus, changing settings, uh, and customizing the game to the player's liking. The second purpose is allowing the player to interact. So this, go this goes two ways. Uh, first, the player can interact with the game via, via the user interface, but we can also interact with the player through the UI. And the final one is to try and do both of these while looking stylish as heck. Because UI is an amazing way to give character and bring the atmosphere, even further enhance the atmosphere of the game. So you might be asking, okay, all this sounds, sounds really cool. Uh, I can see where you're going for, but why, why should I make games UI? I mean, what's in it for me? And to be honest, the number one reason that I always give, and the number one reason for me personally as a, as a, as a UI designer, is that you never be bored. And trust me on that. Like, for example, uh, UI encompasses so many things that you can do that uh, one day you'll be like, okay, uh, I'm a cartographer now. I need to create map a map that basically represents various points of interest to the player. I need to create the interaction between the player and the map so that they can browse it around, zoom in, zoom out. Uh, I need to make it so that they orient themselves good. So, you know, cartography, orientation skills that can be applied here. And then the next day you'll be like, boom, okay, now I gotta work uh, on uh, uh, economy and provide a way for the player to actually trade the items that they uh, acquire uh, so that they can sell, they can buy, and suddenly you're designing an interface which is pretty much uh, uh, akin to e-commerce, and it needs to handle transactions, it needs to handle uh, making offers, uh, uh, selling, buying, rebuying uh, if you if you sold the wrong item, and so forth and so on. And then the next day you come into work and like boom, now I gotta make UI for this mini game that the player is going to be playing inside our actual game. You know, like uh, this example here from Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, where you have this little neat um, hacking game, which is basically just user interface. You know, you just uh, browse around, you connect the different pathways uh, and try and uh, hack different nodes uh, on the game. And then you're like, okay, great. I've done cartography now. Uh, I, I, I did uh, trading. Uh, I did UI for a mini game. Uh, comes next week and uh, boom, it's cooking time now. 
where <laughs> you have to you know, figure out uh, you have a mechanic where basically the player can cook different meals in order to now boost in some way their uh, character. So now you're like, okay, we have ingredients, we have recipes. Uh, those ingredients can be combined to make uh, new recipes or you know use existing ones. And I need to show how those effects you now basically uh, uh, affect uh, the player character. And now you're designing a cooking app. And then it's like, okay, all of these cool things now need to be explained to the player. Boom, comes in tutorial. Now you gotta be now, now you gotta figure out a way to communicate all of these cool mechanics that are in the game uh, to the player so that they know how to actually play the game and you're designing uh, information overlays and uh, tutorial to uh, tutorial pop-ups and other hints and stuff like that and then you're like oh, we have character customization now you need to create an immersive way that's also that also, that uh, allows the player to uh, customize their character and change every little detail on it. Their hairstyle, their eyes, uh, the size of their chin, uh, the size of their lips, uh, the the distance between their eyes. And you also need to make it, uh, you, you not overwhelm the player. So that's, that's, that's the top reason. You know, you'll never be bored. Just UI offers so much variety of what can be done that every day is a new challenge. Every day is a new field for you to go and research and explore and turn it into an interface. And, but there's a second reason as well. User interface allows you to go wild. What do I mean by that? I mean, you've probably noticed that in, in the past five years or so, the interface of most of the apps and software that you interact with has become pretty um, boring. And I mean, all of the websites now pretty much follow the same four or five template patterns and layouts. All of the mobile apps are like, okay, we're just gonna strip all of the UI from it and just focus on the content. So put everything on a white background, use the black font. And that's a great way to expose content uh, and uh, hook hook users uh, for engagement and make it as easy as possible for them to, uh, you know, find what they're looking for. But in games, we're not looking, we're not looking that, we're not looking for that. In games, we, as I said earlier, we want to, while communicating and interacting with the player, be cool as heck. So basically, you can do this, you know, you can go absolutely wild. Take a comic book style and make that your UI. Have vibrant colors. Uh, use a font that's uh, 48 pixels big and that it's not even aligned on the same uh, X line. No one's going to stop you and it's going to look cool. Add awesome transitions and animations like these examples here from Persona 5. Check it out. You don't see that in websites. You don't see that on Instagram or on the most of the mobile apps that all of us are using because they try to optimize for data. But in games, we can do it. And it, it, people are not going to hate it. No, it's, it's going to enhance their experience. It's going to uh, put them more into the atmosphere and the vibe of the whole game. So you can make all of these amazing graphical transitions. You can make the UI part of the in-game world itself. That's called diegetic UI, by the way. Like here in Alien Isolation, uh, where we have our protagonist uh, basically using this uh, gadget in order to uh, establish connections uh, and, commu and communicate and also hack or uh, hack various devices. So basically you're gonna be designing the UI for the device that's actually in game and the character is going to be interacting with it or uh, you can make the ui uh, feel like uh, the interface of the spaceship that the player is going to be uh, operating like here in elite dangerous where uh, all of the user interface is like an uh, augmented reality overlay that sits on top of the game and it's not just you know a standard static menu and just buttons here and there but it feels like the pilot of the spaceship which you are is interacting with every single one of these elements and they're looking at them and uh, it, it, it looks incredibly immersive also uh in games skeuomorphism 
we love it. I mean, the rest of the uh, design world, they might be going for all, uh, they might be going all minimal and all flat, but in, in games, go skeuomorphic. I mean, it, it, it just serves to enhance the feeling so much more. Like here in the Diablo 2 resurrected UI, you can see there's so much detail that's done, that, that, that's just, that, that has been paid to the user interface, all of this ornamentation, the patterns, making it feel like, uh, like these heavy blocks. And does it look amazing? Yes, it does. Can you still interact with it in, a, in an easy way? Yes, it does. Is it boring? Absolutely no. I mean, you can even go full crazy mode and make a, 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 a skew tree look like this, well, whatever it is, weird constellation of stars is in Final Fantasy VII Remake, but you get my point, you know, there is absolutely no limit to the way that you can represent the various information with user interface, and that's why it's so cool. Now that I've covered, you know, why you should do UI for games, let's talk a little bit about what are the actual roles uh, in UI, so what, what can you be? You know, so number one, uh, we have the UI artist. So what is that? The UI artist usually comes from an art background. So maybe you've uh, gone to an art academy, uh, for example, uh, you have a degree in it, or you just love drawing and you're really, really good at it. The responsibilities are uh, usually uh, limited mostly to, well, drawing. So they work on defining the visual style of the user interface. They draw icons, patterns, textures, backgrounds, various 2D assets that might be needed for the user interface as well. Um, and they, uh, they very much focus on the aesthetic part of the UI. And then we have the UI designer. Uh, typically, the background here is similar to my background, you know, coming from uh, graphic design, web design, or mobile design. Uh, and the responsibilities of the UI designer are usually around designing the actual screens. So, for example, uh, they might focus on how the layouting uh, will be, where uh, certain buttons will go, uh, how the uh, HUD will be laid out. This is also uh, usually done uh, in tandem with the UX designer, if there is one on the team. And uh, UI designers also um, do interaction design and animation design. What does that mean? For example, all of those cool transitions that you saw in the Persona uh, videos earlier in the slide, that's usually the work of a UI designer. And then we have the UI developer. So uh, this, this person usually comes from a front-end or a game dev background, so you know they're coders and their main responsibility is implementing all of the craziness that the previous two roles have made for them. Now, uh, keep in mind that there are many, many, many other roles that revolve around UI and UX, and uh, different studios might have different uh, terms for them, but this is kind of like the general three verticals that covers uh, what usually uh, goes into designing a user interface. Now, what skills you're going to need in order to be a UI designer or a UI artist, you know? Uh, first of all, uh, vector design. Uh, that means, uh, you know, being able to create uh, vector shapes uh, via in Illustrator or any other vector design tool. Uh, designing high fidelity screens. That basically means that you can take, for example, a mock-up or a wireframe that a UX designer has made and uh, create a version of it that as close as possible to how it should look in the final game when it's implemented. So that also means designing the high fidelity assets, which usually the UI developers implement. Uh, working with the in-engine UI layout too. Uh, some, some studios uh, have UI designer, have specific tools that allow UI designers to implement their UI without the help of UI developers. So sometimes uh, that might be required. Uh, doing animation and visual effects uh, as well. And um, usually forgotten, but also very important, documentation and organization. Like every designer, you need to be incredibly, incredibly organized. You need to be able to explain why you've, why you've taken certain decision, why you've designed an element in a particular way, and you need to back up with argumentation. And afterwards, you need to document all of that 
so that if six months after initial implementation, there needs to be a change or a new UI designer comes on board, they can reference that documentation and be like, okay, I see now, that makes sense. That's good. And um, typography, incredibly important because half of the user interface is text. So you, you got to know how to uh, present readable text, uh, how to pair fonts so that they look good. Uh, and please, 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 whenever you start designing UI, make sure your text is big enough so that people can read it regardless of their monitor size. So what tools do we, we, do we usually use? Um, Adobe's Creative Suite, uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, After Effects. For prototyping, uh, we also use uh, Figma or Adobe XD. And when it comes to engines, uh, you know, the, the two biggest ones, uh, Unity or Unreal, or you might, uh, if the studio has their proprietary engine, you might be using uh, whatever they're, they're using, uh, or specific uh, plugin engine tools for designing UI, like Coherent Prism. Back to you, Anna. Yes, let's talk about what UX is um, in comparison to UI. So the UX itself, stands for actually uh, user experience. So let me explain that a bit more. Here's actually some of the things that I do, which is called a mock-up. This is what Alex previously talked about, the collaboration between uh, the UI designer and the UX designer. When it comes to uh, actually setting up, what are we doing here? What do we even want to have on these screens? Why this information here? Do we have room for all these informations? And what is going on and happening on the screens. So here's, so this one is an example of a mockup for uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 that I um, helped creating. And um, so here you can see the kind of information that I uh, place everywhere. So a lot of gray boxes. And uh, that is because I want to draw attention to the right things. So yes, doing gray boxes is actually uh, usually how I do it. And um, uh, you can see some of these texts here, just the basic text, you know, insert cool animation here. Here needs to be a 3D character um, or milestone text and all of that type of information. Um, so let's see uh, how this mockup actually looks in the game. Here's how it looks like when you actually add all the really cool images, the really cool UI and make it look real with the 3D characters. So we go back, we see the basic information, the basic menus and everything, and we see it in the game. It's, right now, this is really similar. Um, so you guys can see the, the, the story version and the final version. So here I have some uh, more animations for you to see um, how I'm actually thinking when I'm looking at the UX design of a, the front end. I'm actually looking at, do we have the correct information going through the whole menu? And do we have the, um, what do they need to know? What's gonna be on every screen? And in this example, we added skill points to the game. So we wanted people to um, be able to see if they can uh, upgrade things and how many skill points they have. We wanted to show that throughout the whole menu system. So this is um, how we added it. So it's always, um, you can always see it in the menus and everything because otherwise people go here after a match, they get really confused. They don't know like, wait, did I level up? Did I get skill points? I don't remember. And then they have to go into a lot of menus before even knowing if they can upgrade something. That's not really what we wanted. So we added um, skill points and that information really early in the menus. So, um, it's easily follow along and you can upgrade your really cool um, special cards. So let, let me take back to the beginning of what UX usually means. Um, here you see some example of what we actually do a lot in in school. And this is also sometimes used in different levels uh, when we work as well. So UX is usually a lot of draw, going back to this draw board and um, sketching up ideas, sketching up uh, interaction flows and what we need on each um, screen. So this is usually means pen and paper. And 
it always comes back to that is a really good way to just get your ideas out of your head and get them on paper. Um, before we even take this into the cool programs we're using, we I usually take a lot of post-it notes and draw up my ideas. Step number two, we take these rough ideas and the rough sketches of what we want on the screens and we put them in um, a design program and we draw up these gray boxes. Um, it's a lot of gray boxes, yes, because it should be basic. It should not look pretty yet because that's what we add later. Right now it just needs to be really simple and clear. So here you see a new user sign up in a flow and um, it really just uses a tool for us to basically draw up what we want the user to do and what buttons we need to have so we can talk to the programmers and see if this is possible, if they see any problems with it, if there's anything we need to design for or fix in any other way. Um, okay, so what is the purpose of this? Why is the UX role even a thing? So um, similar to what Alex said with UI, um, UX design is also about communicating to the player. Um, this can be in different ways, and I will go into more detail on that later, but communication is not only UI, and it can be um, icons and audio and some other UI version of um, how we want to communicate to the player. And the second thing is, um, I'm looking at what is important for the player to notice at any time, because we can throw everything at the player at once, but it's going to be so much information and overwhelming that you can't play the game because so much is happening. So a lot of the things I'm doing is prioritizing what the player need to notice in each segment of the game. And it's a lot of times removing all the uh, noise and annoying stuff. So you can actually focus on one thing. And so basically this comes down to, um, I'm making sure that the menus and gameplay is not confusing <laughs> because if we throw everything at the player at once, you will not be able to notice what you actually should focus on because there's too much happening. Okay, so what I touched on before is that UX is not only UI. What I mean with that is that there are, in video games especially, there are so many ways for us to communicate with the player. We can use audio, this can be just some simple sounds when you click on menus, uh, cool audio when you open the box to signify that, yay, you opened the box and you got something really cool out of it. It's money, yay, good, like that kind of feedback. But it also can be um, me saying like, well, this right now, we didn't really need the characters around them or the NPCs or other creatures around you to make, uh, give you suggestions and give you uh, feedback on what's happening in the game. And that can also be a way to communicate to the player that something inside the world is telling you what to do in the game. Another way of just uh, communicating is, of course, texts and descriptions. And this is not only for the text to be big enough to be readable, but it's also about what do you write? How do you give really clear instructions? How do you write uh, good many buttons text that are not confusing and um, a lot of a lot of other descriptions that if you're not careful it can be really long descriptions and it can be really confusing so sometimes you have to really back a little bit and make it simpler and just um, figure out a way to say something in a shorter way because people want to play the game we don't want to read paragraphs uh, of too much text so another way of communicating is also using the environment in the game itself. This can be um, me going through the game and seeing like, are we using signs or exit signs or text on walls or other environment cues or light bulbs flickering and stuff? Is that drawing the attention of the player? Because that is also something that it can be really cool to add those stuff in a game. But if you just add all of these cool stuff, you can actually make it more difficult for the player to understand what the game, like where the where that you go and everything. Because if you make a door in an alley, like a red door, and you add like a big sign of um, gold digger on the side of the wall, and then you add a flickering light on top, 
it feels like, oh, that door is going to have like a super secret uh, thing in it. I should go in there. And then you go up there and you can't open the door. That would be really confusing. Um, so it's really about figuring out that the environment doesn't give the right wrong signals um, to the player in the game. Another way we communicate something good in the game happening is to celebrate when uh, the player does something good. It can be, you know, killing the boss, um, collecting enough money for something, or leveling up. So we want to celebrate this, and uh, it's about when we want to celebrate and how we want to celebrate you did something good, and when you leveled up, and what happens when you level up. Another way is also interaction with technology, and this means that the different, um, there are so many platforms right now out there, and they have different way of interacting with technology. It means that um, for consoles, you use a controller. So the system with you, how you use your hands is different. For PC, it's different because you're using your mouse. And for mobile phones, you don't even have a lot of buttons. You can only use your fingers to press stuff. And that changes how you design the product and how you design a game, because you kind of need to be able to click on stuff and swipe on stuff, but the games should be different because it's not easy to do a lot of complicated stuff. Another way of communicating to the player is to use VFX. And this can be, you know, a lot of in-game actions and uh, a lot of cool effects happening on the player. That this is, a, for me, usually a more fun way instead of just adding a big UI text that says, Yay, you leveled up. You can add something really cool on the player, maybe to make it look like you're boosted, you leveled up, you gain something. Um, so this is also a way to show the player that something happened. Yeah, so there's a lot of cool ways to communicate, actually. OK, let me talk a little bit about accessibility, which is a really hot topic for video games and all technology. Um, because accessibility is also a big part that the UX and the UI people are looking at. Um, so this comes down to that not everyone in the world, not everybody in the world is the same, and we can't play games in the same way. And this has been a big thing right now because technology is on this point right now where we can design good design, we can design good games for everyone. So um, let me break this down a little bit. Uh, accessibility comes in different forms, but it's usually um, how your body physically can't do certain things or is capable in different ways. And this can be actually that um, a lot of PC games or controller games, it's actually difficult to use the controller in a, in a way if you don't have the same mobility in your hands. So there's a lot of cool ways that people are um, using different controls right now for them to be able to uh, play games and have fun. Um, and another way is that not everyone has super good eyesight. A lot of us is using um, glasses or different ways like that or contacts. But there's also a lot of people in the world that are colorblind in different ways. And we need to design the game that they don't have problem uh, playing the game because they didn't see a certain color sometimes. So that's one way of um, the UI and color needs to be addressed in this way. Um, and among other things that um, all of us are not, um, don't process information in the same way, or we can't remember everything in the same way. Um, so games should not punish people just because you don't have good memory or you're really, really tired or there's a lot of information throwing at you on the screen right now and you're really stressed. And we should also think about how we design these things or so people can adjust the game themselves for them to have fun in the game. Uh, and we also have audio because even if we uh, we have characters in the game telling you stuff and go to the red door in the corridor and kill the boss. But if you can't hear or you can't pick up on audio cues that are keep throwing at you, you might be missing a cru crucial part of the game and you can't progress in the game. So there's a lot of ways that uh, accessibility actually affects how we play games. 
For example, we have here in Apex, um, this is the first thing that you pop up when you uh, want to play the game. Um, a lot of these accessibility options are actually shown right away when you start the game. So you have accessibility for text chats and uh, text to speech and a lot of that things. Um, because this is crucial when it comes to you understanding and enjoying the game. Um, and every game also has a lot of accessibility options in menus and stuff. And that is also comes down to me to figure out what fits in our game and what things do we want people to be able to adjust so they can play the game. So let's look a little bit on what you can actually work on in UX. We have some different roles here. Um, for me then, I'm a UX designer. So I'm doing a lot of wireframes and mockups and layouts and uh, listening to feedback and everything um, and that kind of stuff. But then we also have someone that's specific about talking to users and they're called user researchers. And they organize play tests, they gather the feedback and they communicate what they have seen people mention and they communicate this to us and all the, the whole uh, game project and the team so they can figure out how we can make the game better. And then we have a, another role that is called uh, product designer, but this is usually more used in uh, web design and app design, but it's also comes down to designing the full product of a app and website. And it also comes down to making um, wireframe mockups, the UI layouts and prototypes and designing the whole product usually. And then we have meta, meta designer. In video games, this comes down to making, um, um, designing for players to be engaged in the game. And this can be making rewards and leveling up and what features we want and pro the priority of information and um, a lot of the what is driving you to uh, complete tasks and everything like that in a game. And that's a really important part of the game because a lot of games right now are about, you know, collecting special items and leveling up and feeling like you're making progress in the game and uh, getting all those really cool rewards. And um, yeah, so that is a, another role that is also about um, engagement usually. So what do you actually need to do to become a UX designer? Um, so here's some things that I usually work with, which is creating uh, MVP mockups, which is really quick mockups of ideas we have or creating detailed sketches because sometimes when we're further along in the progress in the game, I can take what the UI artists are doing and seeing if it fits into the prototypes I'm making. And um, it's a lot about documenting design and functionality because even if I have all the cool ideas and we come up with cool ideas, we also need to write them down <laughs> because if we have new people coming into the studio, and I'm just haven't written anything down. We can't really work well as a team and I need to be able to show someone that what we're actually making. Um, another really important part is that we are listening to player feedback and players right now, it can be internally in the studio, uh, other parts of the gaming studio or um, in the future, everyone that's playing our game. Um, so some, some ways of thinking about UX design is um, um, we usually say that we have a like holistic thinking, which means that the whole experience of the whole game comes down to how you understand the game. And um, so this comes into UI, audio, um, VFX, and other visuals and stuff. So all, all of this comes down to how you experience the game. And uh, we think a lot about how, we read a lot of books about understanding the brain because um, how you remember stuff and how you experience games is, uh, comes, a lot of, comes a lot of times down to how your brain processes information. And um, um, another thing that's really good, if you wanna become a UX designer is to, uh, I'm, I'm sometimes saying that I make the complicated simple which is that uh, we have so many ideas and concepts of what to do in the game and we can throw everything into the game, but it will just be a hot mess. 
So um, a lot of the times it's me making it simple and focusing on what we need to work on and what things are kind of getting in the way of the cool experience of the game. And um, uh, UX designers usually have, you need to have a lot of empathy for players and the problems that are having. Because um, that is usually, that's basically what I'm doing all day. I'm fixing problems so players can actually enjoy the game. And because if they are annoyed, if they're confused, if they get angry at the game, they're not going to have a fun time. So that is actually a really important part that you actually empathize with them and you agree with them <laughs> that, yeah, you shouldn't struggle with this part of the game. I'm going to make it better. So let's look at a little bit quickly on what kind of tools I'm using. Um, this is tricky because throughout my years of doing UI design and mobile design and game design, the tools we're using are always changing. And um, so these things are not set in, a set in stone kind of. It usually comes down to what tool that studio is using and uh, most of them are real quick to understand because they are not that complicated. But some of the things I've been using and I really like using right now is um, um, Sketch, Figma, Adobe XD for sketching and coming up with uh, layouts and everything. And then we have for creating more of the organizing concepts and stuff, we have um, Visio, Draw, IO, um, and uh, we put all of these ideas into Confluence, which is the program we're using here at the studio. And of course, we can't forget the post-it notes and pen and paper, because that's always a classic when it comes down to drawing up some quick ideas and figuring out what we want to do as a team. If you want to learn more about user interface and user experience in games, I strongly suggest you visit wecanfixitinui.com where you'll find out a huge amount of resources and insight about uh, what are the various UI role, UI and UX roles, seniority levels, uh, help on finding your role in the, in the games UI industry, uh, how to prepare a CV, a cover letter, a portfolio, and all of that. So do take a look. And if you have any questions, we are in chat. Yes, and uh, we are now going to... Uh talk to you guys and ask, uh, answer your uh, questions.